So we should get an announcement. Okay, well, hello everyone, and welcome back to another International Primatology Lecture Series lecture. Today we have a discussion, a little bit of a different format with Professor Franz Deval, so we who should get an announcement, who will be introduced by Dr. Mike Huffman in just a minute. But just uh, as a bit of information to get us started, this lecture series um, was designed to kind of provide uh, origin stories from really well-known international primatologists and people in allied fields. And it's being put on by the Center for International Collaboration and Advanced uh, Studies in Primatology, which is part of Kyoto University's Inuyama campus, and now the Center for the Evolutionary Origins of Human Behavior. Uh, this is part of our graduate seminar series in science communication. And we took the opportunity to try and share it with as many of you as possible. And so, Towards that end, I'd like to get this event started. This is lecture 18, and here's Dr. Mike Huffman to introduce our guest. Thanks, Andrew, and welcome, Franz. Um, it's really a, a great pleasure to have Franz on this series. Um, I've known him for a number of years now. I was trying to think when the first time we physically met, but um, something that that that's deep in my memories is is the first access I had to some of Franz's works, and that's the that's the now I, I, iconic book Chimpanzee Politics. I often try to introduce some of the books of the the speakers. Um, when I was reading through Franz's book, I was just diving into Japanese macaque politics in Kyoto when I was studying the um, Arashiyama group, and and it really opened my eyes to to the world of, of primate cognition and and some of the day to day interactions that that animals have with each other and what that can tell us about ourselves. So I was really impressed with the work of um, Franz in that in his earliest book, and. Um, Another book on my shelf is The Ape and the Sushi Master. That was when Franz actually came to Japan and really um, led, led, lent a great service to in introducing Japanese primatology and the early history of Imanishi and some of the contemporary primatologists at the time that Franz was visiting us here in Japan. I had the pleasure of taking him over to my mentor's house, Professor Itani, um, and we did some some touring around Kyoto and up to Arashiyama, of course. But the one that I've really, really fallen in love with lately, it's got a really catchy title, is Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? And I read through this in a couple sittings. I just couldn't couldn't put it down. It really reads like some of the, the, the old classic, classical European ethnological um popularized science stories like like those of Conrad Lawrence. It's really, really a nice book. And if you ever, if you have a chance, please get a copy. I think it's it's really a, a wonderful um, window in, in, into the world of all animals. Jumping back to chimpanzee politics and a way of, of starting off this conversation, um, I noticed that you um, dedicate this book to Jan van Hoof, your graduate advisor. Um, I've I've known Jan for for many years as well. He's he's a wonderful man, very very knowledgeable in all all aspects. I kind of think of him as the um, Itani of the Netherlands. His his personality and his his breadth and and everything. Could you just tell us a little bit about how you got started in in your field and what what your experiences were as a graduate student under Jan's um, guidance? Yeah. That's interesting. Well, thanks for the introduction <laughs> and all the compliments and everything. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And, uh, you know, chimpanzee politics. Yeah, that was my first book. I had written some articles before it. And of course, written many articles since it. But um, it was the first popular book that I wrote. And, and Jan, actually, Jan van Hoof, my professor, he was a bit nervous about that. Uh, so like... Um, I was talking about primate strategies and social behavior, and I was calling it politics. <laughs> and um, he felt I was not very careful, but you know, I, I was a student at the time and very in the beginning of my career, I had nothing to lose basically, I felt. It's not, it's not like an established scientist who takes an enormous risk. I, you know, I, I felt very strongly that primates have strategies and that they have cognition and, and that politics is the right word to use. 
But, but let me tell you a funny story. There were some political scientists who objected to the term politics. And uh, not the primatologist. There was not a single primatologist who objected to the term. I, it must be because we all think that they have politics, you know. Uh, but there were some political scientists who invited me to a political science conference and had, they had a whole panel discussion. What is politics and can the primates have it? That was the question. Mm -hmm. And I was there like it was like an inquisition for me because I showed them pictures of politicians. You know how the politicians always posture and look big and strong. And I felt it was very chimpanzee like and I had comparisons like that body language basically but that's not what they wanted to talk about they had definitions like um, um, politics is is the system of rules for society or something like that you know they, they had complex definitions and uh, and they felt that chimpanzees didn't have those rules and then there was an older gentleman in the audience an older political scientist who said why don't we go with the the most popular definition of politics. And I thought, well, what, which, which one is that? And, and the most popular one that, that has a, a book title like that, politics is who gets what, when, and how. I said, well, if, if that's <laughs> the definition of politics, uh, we can talk, you know? And so we, we decided that actually that definition might be applicable to the primates. And so we, we ended up being on good terms on this. But uh, yeah, Jan, Jan was nervous about me being so popular in my writing. Uh, but Jan was a great mentor because for me, it's very important. Um, he studied facial expressions and he worked with a, a, a psychologist, Nico Freida, who studied emotions in humans. Mm -hmm. And you know, facial expressions and emotions is almost the same topic. And uh, Jan was not nervous about the term emotions. He did not use it much in his writings. He's, he had been asked by Tinbergen to stay away from the term, um, but he was not nervous about it. He felt uh, animals probably had emotions. Uh, and so I, I grew up in an environment as a young scientist where that was not a taboo topic, which I think is very important because many of us of my generation, they grew up uh, the word emotion could not be used, feeling could not be used, consciousness, intention, understanding, intelligence. Intelligence could not be used because people would say, what is intelligence? Isn't it just a learning ability? And then they had reduced it to learning, which was the only thing they cared about. Uh, and so um, uh, I was happy to have a professor who was a bit more open-minded than that. Hmm. And that's kind of like the debate that went on a little bit later with the word culture in primates and and how difficult that is for some places. And you get cultural anthropologists facing primatologists and the hair starts flying and <laughs> that's that's yeah, settled because, down. Because they um yeah, they, they had definitions of culture. There was a definition, I don't know who made that. The definition is culture is what makes us human. <laughs> well, if, if that's a definition, then, uh, you know, you, <laughs> we cannot talk about primate culture. And, and I think Imanishi, the, the refreshing thing of the Japanese primatology was that they, had, they didn't have these sort of prejudices in that regard. Uh, right. They, they, right. they wondered what culture was, and, and he wondered if a wasp could have it. And now we have actually insect studies that seem to indicate social learning. Yeah. So, so, so we're getting to that point, you know? Yeah. Emotion and play in bumblebees even, which is exciting. Yeah. 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 yeah Franz, I think in a previous um, interview we did for the primate cast, you were talking about how you felt some um, kinship with some of the Japanese primatologists as well. In the context of language, you were talking about how um, as a, a non-native English speaker, um, there's challenges to be able to get heard and, and, and the world can be a bit dominated. But I think what you just mentioned also, um, how maybe there was less taboo in Japan about thinking about some of the ideas of culture and sociality and primates and relating that to human behavior as well. I mean, that was the whole uh, raison d'etre for why Imanishi was starting to study primates was to understand human society. And I just wonder if you also felt some kinship in that in your earlier days and with what was being done in Japan. Yeah, I've always felt 
close to Japanese primatology, partly because as a student, I was warned away from Japanese papers. So, so uh, as a student, and I was not the only one, I've heard the same story from students of Robert Hind and, and other people in the West, is we were told Japanese primatology is not to be taken seriously because they use names for their monkeys, which is already <laughs> wrong. And, uh, and they talk about culture and they follow them over time. And they don't talk much about species specific behavior, which was the big thing for the ethologists. They, they talk more about individual relationships. And so um, uh, I always felt that that was unfair to Japanese primatology to be like that. And, and now of course, we all have adopted the, 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 the methodology that came out of that is if you talk to a, a researcher on hyenas or elephants, they name their animals and they follow them over time, which is exactly the same methodology. So, so I felt Japanese primatology has won in that regard, but they were not recognized. Mm. And I remember that when I came to Japan to talk about all these issues in, in what is it, 20 years ago or so, um, uh, that I heard that, uh, for example, Itani, I think Itani told us that story that he toured the US um, with Ray Carpenter. Ray Carpenter was a friend of his, was an, an American who really appreciated Japanese primatology. And he toured the US and people didn't want to believe that he could recognize a hundred monkeys. They, they saw there was an impossibility. And so they laughed at him, it's, it's not possible. And uh, of course, now many people do that and are capable of doing that. But um, that was the thinking at the time. People, people didn't take it seriously. Yeah, and the yeah. other issue with Japanese primatology is that I feel that in, in scientific conferences, the native English speakers, they, they have an easy life and they don't realize it. They, they, they can make jokes. How are you ever, if you talk in another language, going to make a joke that falls well? That's very difficult. So, so they, they always win all the debates. They have most to say. They have the best expressions for what they want to say. And um, all the people who speak a different language, they're sort of struggling to keep up with them. And uh, the native speakers don't realize that. They, they don't realize the tremendous advantage that they have. And uh, as a result, if someone comes with new ideas, like Imanishi did, he, he came with new ideas about the family, about culture, um, uh, about individual uh, relationships and so on, um, they're gonna be translated by the native speakers in other language. And so, and so I remember, for example, um, Toshisada Nishida, uh, who, who I was friends with, um, and, and, and I visited his field site and so on in the Mahala Mountains. Nishida had discovered that chimpanzees have a unit group, as he called it, in the, in the, the meaning that you see them traveling alone or in small parties, but they're all glued together in one uh, bigger group. They don't always travel together, but they're all together. That's the group. And later, of course, we learned, he didn't know that at the time, I believe, but then we learned that they are territorial and highly aggressive to each other also. But he called it a unit group but we never talk about unit groups anymore. We talk about communities, chimpanzees of communities. So the, the English speakers repackaged the idea of Nishida in another term that was better. Mm. And as a result, we forget where it came from, <laughs> but the concept came actually from him. And, and so I, I, I sympathize with that because I'm, I'm not a native English speaker, even though I think my language Dutch is as close as you can get to English. I mean, it's extremely close. Uh, and um, but even for me to write an English article or book, I have to have a big dictionary next to me and leaf through it. And it takes an enormous amount of time to write in English. And, and I don't have that anymore, but it used to be like that. And so I sympathize with people who struggle with the language. Uh, and, and I feel um, uh, the native English speakers need to be taken that into account a bit more than they do normally. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I was going to ask you about that. I, you, you, you've written so many things, and you, you write so eloquently. Was it always 
easy for you or difficult? And you, you kind of answered that. But how how did you become as proficient as you are? Just if in, in, in a few words, I think there's a lot of students listening in who have the same situation. They're coming from a, a another language. I, I did the same thing living here in 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 Japan and and, and greatly appreciate that that struggle and the difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, if you could just relate a little bit more about yeah. about that process and how how you became. So my writing, you know, if I compare my writing with let's say other primatologists who write popular books, like let's say Robert Sapolsky, who I admire greatly, or Sarah Hardy. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I think, oh, my English is so primitive. It's so, oh. <laughs> I, I'm sort of embarrassed by it. On the other hand, since I write in another language, I'm simple. So I write simple sentences and I look for the best adjective that I can use for something instead of some, some authors, they have 10 objectives with commas between them because they have so much choice in their vocabulary and I don't, I, I try to pick the best one. And so as a result, my writing is simpler, and, and of course, for popular writing, that's not a bad thing necessarily to have simple writing. And I remember, I remember when Kumar wrote a book, Hans Kumar, he, he wrote a book which was semi-popular about the ecology of the Hamadryas baboons. And uh, I remember him telling me, yeah, he said, my writing is very simple, but it's understandable. And I think that's, that's at least what you can say. But I, when I read someone like Sapolsky, I think, well, my English is primitive. And, and, and I, but I cannot change that. It's not my language, and so I cannot change that. And I like writing in popular books. Compared to writing scientific articles, I, I've written, I don't know, maybe two, 300 scientific articles. And that's a very different kind of writing because that's very regimented. The introduction and you need to cite the right sources and then the methodology and then the results and you need to have the right statistics and then the discussion. And uh, I mean, it's extremely constrained what you do and it's very technical. And you're not supposed to show that you have fun in your research and you're not supposed to, <laughs> to tell funny anecdotes about things and certainly not mention the exceptions because you're trying to convince them that your data is very convincing. So you, um, you're not going to talk about exceptional behaviors. So um, the scientific articles, it's, it's a bit of a boring business, I think, um, writing those. And, and so then when you write a popular book, all of a sudden you can say, well, I'm going to talk about this um, and, and you can mention an anecdote and I like to tell anecdotes, uh, even though you also need to make clear to the readers that behind the anecdote, sometimes there's more evidence than just the anecdote. Like, so you just, you can describe, let's say a power struggle between two males, but you always need to make clear that that's not the only one you have seen and that it's maybe a pattern because, because otherwise people get confused about that. So um, I, I enjoy that very much, writing popular books, um, but it's a very different business from, uh, it's like a separate career almost from yeah. your scientific papers. Yeah. And I think you use a separate part of your brain. I, I, I feel that as well, just sitting down and writing, trying to describe something that I, I've seen in the field to other people or to colleagues or, or mm -hmm. friends. And it just feels like a different part of the brain is, is heating up than when you're sitting down and writing a scientific paper like you said. Yeah. Yeah. And Franz, um, maybe that's a good a good way to transition into thinking about some of these books you've written. So you've tackled, I'll just list a few of things. I mean, politics and chimpanzee politics, um, morality and religion, empathy, now sex and gender in your most recent book, Different. And you mentioned you enjoy reading it and it, um, you, you can tell stories in a way that you don't. But how? what is your process for deciding what to write about? Uh -huh. Yeah, it, the, the book on gender is a bit unusual because I decided to do that because it's such a hot topic in society mm -hmm. and because I noticed that people are, are fascinated by the biology of it. They, they hear, of course, very often in the news and on the media that uh, gender is purely cultural and that uh, we can change it any way we want and it's a flexible and... and and then they talk to me as a primatologist and they want to hear what I think, because I think they're skeptical about the idea that it's so cultural and so flexible. Because 
anyone who has raised a boy and a girl knows that they don't behave the same way. And, and so they want to hear from a primatologist, what do you think about uh, the biology of gender? Uh, and, and, and for me, it's a less, less loaded topic. So if, if I were to talk about humans, people might get very upset if I say men and women are different. But if I talk about chimpanzees, they accept it because uh, this is based on observation and measurement and stuff like that. And so the acceptance rate is higher. Uh, and that's how I ended up on that particular topic. But most of my topics have to do with uh, cognition and emotions in, in animals. And, and my writing about the evolution of morality uh, in, in some, like in Good Natured and some of the other books uh, is an extension of that because I, I feel morality has a lot to do with empathy. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a topic that I'm very interested in. And, and when I first started to write about um, empathy, which is like in the 1990s, for, first of all, people didn't believe animals could have that. That's one thing. But the other one was also that they said it, it relates to morality. That, that would make animals moral beings. Which, which I'm not sure I would agree with. I think morality is probably bigger than empathy. But anyway, that's, that's how they looked at it. And that's how I got in, interested in that topic and the evolution of morality. So I think when you started, well, before chimpanzee politics, I think if I remember correctly, you started your primatological career thinking about studying aggression in the chimpanzees at Arnhem Zoo in the Netherlands. And I think I've read or heard you say that there just wasn't, as much as maybe you expected, or you started thinking a bit differently about what society, the parts that society that made up society, and you you fell onto conflict resolution. So, yeah, can you maybe talk about the process there, and and what kind of you discovered in those earlier kind of studies of the chimpanzees at the zoo? Well, that's interesting. When when I was a student, Conrad Lawrence had written his book on aggression, which was the big book at the time, and no one could talk about anything else than aggression and violence. Um, all the books about human evolution were about how we are an aggressive species. Now, maybe after World War II, there was a logical thing to say and a logical obsession. And uh, all the studies that I saw on animals were had to relate to aggression somehow. And so I was asked by Jan van Hoof and others to work on aggressive behavior in the chimpanzee. And, and so I went to the Arnhem Zoo which was the big colony I worked on, uh, which was the biggest colony and still is probably in the world, 25 chimps on a very big island. And um, I didn't see much aggression. Uh, these chimps were laying around the whole day and then grooming and then playing. And sometimes there was a fight, but you had to wait really long to see a fight between them. And, and so for me, that first year with the chimps, was a time that I got to know their personalities, I got to know their facial expressions and, and all sorts of things about them. But aggression was not the big topic. And then about a year into it, uh, the males started to shuffle their dominance relationships and, and there were challenges by one male to another and so on. And that's when I started to see conflicts. And that's also when I started to see reconciliations after conflicts. And so individuals who had a fight and then would embrace and kiss 10 minutes later. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And so I actually got much more interested in the reconciliation part than the aggression part. And, and I still remember <laughs> going to conferences where everyone was talking about competition and aggression and violence and uh, in all sorts of animals, in rats and sticklebacks and all sorts of animals, aggressive behavior, threat behavior. What does it mean? What is the motivational system? That was sort of the terminology that they used at the time. Um, and I would come and I say, well, they reconcile, the chimpanzees reconcile after fights. They kiss and embrace, isn't that interesting? And they were all sort of like, wow, what, what is this? Um, <laughs> They had never thought about that there was a possibility to do that. And, and, and what does it mean? And, and I, I remember people dismissing it. <laughs> people saying, um, well, maybe chimpanzees do that because they do a lot of stuff that we humans do, but my animals would never do that. My animals would never reconcile after a fight. But now we know that almost all social animals, uh, dolphins, whales, um, 
elephants, wolves, you name it, they have reconcile, reconciliations after fights. But it didn't fit with their thinking because their thinking was who wins, who loses, who gets the resources. Um, the competition needs to be functional, of course. Uh, and so they, um, they had no room for reconciliation. Let me, let me tell you a funny story about that. I went with Jan van Hoof to a, a group of psychologists in Amsterdam. We, we were in Utrecht, a different city. And so we went to Amsterdam uh, because we, we were proposing for a student of them a study on reconciliation behavior in the chimpanzee. And these were all rat psychologists. So they worked on rats, mostly Skinnerian. You know, a rat in a box needs to press a lever to get food and stuff like that, you know. And uh, so Jan and I were sitting at the table with all these psychologists. And we said, we want to do this study on reconciliation behavior in the chimpanzees. And the people laughed at us. And they said, it's not possible. It's, it's just not possible that, that they have reconciliation. And so we kept going back and forth. And, and I showed some data and some slides. But, you know, there's only so much you can do to convince people. And then Jan at some point proposed, he said, you know what we do? You come to Arnhem Zoo, which is again a different city, but is, is, Holland is very small, so it was like an hour by train. You come to the Arnhem Zoo and you watch the chimpanzees <coughs> with us, and, and I'm sure something will happen. You will find it interesting. And they refused. Mm. They said, no, no, we don't, we don't need to come. We, we don't need to come to see it because we know it cannot exist. And Jan said, well, if you come, maybe you can, you can see something that's interesting. Now, they, they were convinced it was not a possibility. And so there was really no reason. Um, so we did the project anyway with that student and, and um, we avoided the word reconciliation because uh, so we called it post-conflict contact mm. uh, because they, they found that more acceptable. Um, so, so yeah, so there was a lot of resistance to that kind of thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. All great ideas seem to face a lot of tough resistance in the beginning. And it, it's a shame that it takes so long sometimes for these paradigm changes to happen, science. Yeah, so how was that with self-medication? Self I, I suppose self-medication <laughs> was also oh, a ridiculous, was, was a ridiculous yeah. idea at the time. Yeah, it was It was very hard to convince people. It, it, it got a bad start because of the overuse of mass media to, to describe what was going on and then scientists couldn't buy what how it was being described and there wasn't a lot of data in, in the beginning as well so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah it the sounds me, like the media the media <laughs> sometimes they mess things up also yeah and and leading scientists of the day what what they say everyone follows for a long time and it, it seems to be kind of mm. a, a, a not so healthy environment sometimes but yeah, yeah yeah but popular science changes people's ideas like like you've done i think you've gotten a mm -hmm. lot of people interested in the topics that you're interested in and and the the fields have have really fertilized and 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 become common yeah, common yeah, to most people popular now. science is actually very important to draw people into a field um I think the scientists don't always realize that, but if you want to attract young people into a field, they're not going to start with the scientific articles. It has to come from elsewhere. It has to come from either documentaries on TV or uh, popular right. books. Yeah. Right, right. I was going to ask you that 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 question. I'm glad you you brought that up. It in in I, I guess you've you've answered it. The, the role of popular science in moving science forward. You think that it's a very important process you think that all young scientists should should try like what you did with with the, the chimpanzee politics and in, in, in some level and 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 try and push an idea out there is is, is that yeah. a, a good idea or I, I think popularization is is an important skill and that young scientists should learn i always recommend them not to start with a book to start with some articles in some magazines you know or uh, we used to have things like natural history or national, uh, national geographic. And there are fewer now, but there are many blogs and there are many uh, places where I think you can outlets where you can try, try your hand at this kind of stuff. So don't, tr don't start with a big book. That's, 
that's going to be a disaster <laughs> because it takes it takes a lot of concentration and work to do that right and a and lot start, of time yeah to start with, start with some shorter articles and see how that goes mm. yeah and then I, hope hopefully you have some good editors who also work on your text you know in relation to that, Franz, I know that when you, uh, this was, I think, big news, but after chimpanzee politics, there were some American politicians who also wanted to use the concepts um, that you were writing about and wonder if there's actually some value to them. And, and this, I think, um, relates to how you've always tried to weave the stories that you're telling about primates in, in, into some way to to help us understand ourselves and how we might kind of organize or behave and or, or maybe to understand the the origins of the behaviors we perform. Mm -hmm. But maybe you can talk about that later. But a simpler question is, in addition to, I think it was Newt Gingrich maybe was <laughs> talking about your chimpanzee politics. But do you have any other kind of anecdotes about how, maybe for any of your books, how kind of people um, in certain positions have taken the information and, and tried to kind of fit it into their agenda or... Yeah. And, yeah. and maybe with your gender, recent sex and gender book, that might also be something yeah. to talk about yeah yeah so the, there was a project in the us on forgiveness which took my reconciliation approaches and uh, i I've, I've always been a bit uncomfortable with that because I, i'm happy to talk about reconciliation as a process where two individuals embrace and kiss after a fight and and repair their relationship whether they forgive each other is you know um that's an internal process. Uh, even in humans, I, I often doubt that people forgive and they, they, may, they may reconcile. That doesn't necessarily mean that they really forgive and forget. Um, so, so I found that connection. I found it a bit uh, difficult. Um, but yeah, uh, many people um, have used my material. Uh, like uh, I'm often invited, for example, to speak to family therapists or for business people who want to talk about uh, the business side and reciprocity. I did these experiments on fairness, for example, the interest in that kind of issues, which is more like an economics issue. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, there are many sort of vague applications of what I do to the, in the real world, mm -hmm. even though in the end, people always want to know what humans do more than what the primates do, I think. Right. Yeah. So maybe that's a related to the forgiveness issue. I think you have also made the important point. Um, so empathy is something that you, pro-social behavior and empathy is something you've studied for um, for quite some time. And, and I believe it has now become pretty widely accepted that there are at least some elements of empathy in uh, mm -hmm. non-humans. And I remember 10 years ago, we, when we did this interview for the Primate Cast, actually, you were talking about theory of mind and empathy and how there are different components maybe, or different elements that that species, even humans, we might have, you know, a subset of the components, but maybe not all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that maybe in 10 years from now, this was back in 2012, in 10 years from now, empathy might be looked at in the same way, that there will be all of these different subcomponents of empathy. Um, and you've also mentioned that empathy, sorry, the expression of emotion and the subjective fee, uh, sensation of feelings are to be viewed as two very different things. And maybe that's mm -hmm. related to this forgiveness idea um, mm -hmm. versus reconciliation. So can you maybe talk about that, the nuances of those? Yeah, in the emotion research, that's very difficult just to talk about the feelings of animals. So, so I, I can measure emotions, I, I, in, whether it's in a rat or in a chimp or in a human, I can, I can measure blood pressure, facial expressions, uh, sounds that they make. Um, emotions are easily measurable. And emotions are sometimes very similar, uh, especially between other primates and ourselves, the way they express it um, and the way it affects the heart rate and, and the blood pressure and all sorts of physiological measures. Uh, so emotions is, is, I think, a completely acceptable and easy topic to address. Feelings, the feelings of a chimpanzee, um, which I think is an internal state, uh, a subjective state, it's not accessible to me. And I must say the same is true for humans. So you, you may describe your feelings to me. You may say, I was sad at the funeral of X, but I don't know if your sadness is the same as my sadness. And I don't know 
exactly what went on inside of you. And so, and so even for human feelings, I would be a bit skeptical. Uh, and a lot of the research on emotions in psychology at the moment with humans is actually what I would call feelings, is they, is they, they show people certain images and they, they have them click uh, on certain like angry, sad, uh, happy. They, they have them click on these feeling terminologies it's not research on emotions, that's research on feelings. And, and that's also why we have this big debate. I don't know if you're following this, this Louise Fel, uh, Feldman Barrett, who, who claims for the emotions that they are constructs. Emotions are constructed culturally and with language. That is true for feelings. I'm not sure that that is true for emotions. If I, if I bring a big tiger into the room and you're sitting there on a chair and you didn't expect the tiger, I think there's going to be physiological changes in you that you have absolutely no control over and that have nothing to do with cultural constructs. Um, your heart rate will go up. You will, will get cold feet. You will, well, you, you may defecate even. I mean, I mean, all sorts of things can happen physiologically that um, you have no control over. And so the, the psychologists, when they talk about emotions, they actually very often mean feelings. And when I talk about emotions in my chimps, I, most of the time, I mean bodily changes and facial expressions and sound, sounds that they produce and things like that. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that distinction is extremely important to make. Um, uh, and, and I've been in debates about people because there's, an, in addition, in the psychology literature, there are certain emotions that they call basic. I don't know if you know the six basic emotions. And they say the six basic emotions are the ones that we humans have all over the world. They're universal and we share them with other species, like let's say fear and anger and stuff like that. And then you all the rest of the emotions, and there's many, many more, they are secondary and they are us, they're, they're ours. They don't exist in other species. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with that at all. I, I think um, all of the human emotions, one way or another, can be found in other species. They may be more elaborate in us, they may be more developed sometimes in us, like shame and guilt, maybe more developed in our species, but that doesn't mean that they are totally absent in other mm -hmm. species. But the psychologists, they like to cling to this idea that there are six basic emotions that we humans share with animals and all the rest is our emotional life. And I have trouble with that idea. And it may be true for some species. I don't know non-primates very well, um, but I doubt that it is true for um, for the primates, for sure. Yeah. I'd like to bring in an audience question. Sanjana has a very relevant question to this discussion. So maybe Sanjana, do you want to take the mic and fire away? I don't hear one. Yeah, still muted. I hope she's able. Oh, Tan wrong person. I'm sorry. Sanjita. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, Sanjita. Hi. My mistake. My mistake. Sanjita, please. It's okay. Yeah. So it's really glad to talk to Professor, uh, and I'm always inspired by his work. I have a question about uh, animal grief, and um, I just wanted to know what stage we are uh, in the uh, in understanding grief in animal, and if you if we think that you know the state of grief exists in animal, sometimes we also see. Uh, killings and infanticides and cannibalism within species. So that gives us a doubt whether uh, the emotion like grief actually exists in animal or not. So yeah. that's uh, that's what yeah, I want to understand uh, from Professor. What yeah. is his viewpoint or perspective about it? Yeah. Yeah, I think grief probably exists because we do see we do see depressed reactions and and. Uh, in animals who lose, for example, someone. So it's of course always, grief is always related to attachment. I don't think you would grieve for anyone who you're not attached to. Uh, and so a mother who loses her offspring or um, uh, an adult who loses his or her best friend, that's where you're gonna see grief. Um, you're not gonna see grief. Um, and people sometimes talk with me like they, they have a dog and the dog did not grieve over the cat who died. 
Well, then I always ask, was the dog attached to the cat? That's a logical question. And if, uh, because I do know animals who are very attached even to other species in the home. And I think then there's a strong reaction. And, and I think these reactions um, in, in chimpanzees, for example, I, I've seen cases where a, a female chimpanzee has lost her offspring and, and, and screams for three days. She sits in the corner. She doesn't want to participate with anybody. And she occasionally screams and um, is very depressed, doesn't eat. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that's a very depressed state and I, I wouldn't mind calling it grief. Um, so so I, I do think these feelings may exist sometimes. And in the wild, it's of course a bit harder to observe than in captivity. Um, but for example, um, uh, we recently had a very interesting episode in the Arnhem Zoo where a female chimp had a stillbirth. So, so she, she was expecting all of a sudden the, the, the baby is, uh, she has a stillbirth, the baby is dead and uh, taken away. And uh, there was a very strong reaction of the rest of the group to her. So um, not only was she depressed, clearly, uh, but uh, the whole group responded with a lot of affiliative gestures to her. Uh, and not only on the first day, they did that on the first day, but they did it for a month or so. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I, I believe that paper was published in Primates, maybe. But anyway, that, that was a very strong reaction. And so I think the other chimps recognize the grief also of an individual. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm a believer that it exists, uh, certainly in some species that have strong attachments. Thank you, I, Professor. Thank you. Uh, so do the follow up question is that um, so we we do know that there are there, there are some evidence of grief uh, in primates and non human primates. But like uh, sometime um, when I'm reading, I, find, I see that there are many hypotheses related to it, but something related to cannibalism, infanticides and, you know, killings that how we can justify it like it's the same animal which was emotional or having grief now is going to is now eating the is on uh, infant so how is really contradictory so sometimes you know, it gives a big question mark of whether grief exists whether it's only for an individual or for the entire group yeah i, I know that the primates they can be very very mean to each other and and, and kill each other i never think that that's an argument against let's say grief or empathy or whatever people say that sometimes if I talk about, let's say, empathy and chimpanzees, you say, do you know that these guys, they kill each other? And of course, I know that. But uh, we can say the same thing about humans. Humans kill each other on a massive scale, actually much bigger scale, I would say, than chimpanzees ever do. Uh, genocide is not something that is typical in the primates, but in, in humans, it happens quite a bit. And so... Uh, that's not an argument against saying that humans have grief or empathy or gen tender emotions. Um, so, so we recognize that humans can have both. They can both extremely be extremely nasty and, and ex be extremely altruistic and empathic. And, and the same is true, it, chimpanzees are complex beings too. And, and so the same is true for other species. Th these things can coexist within, within the individual. Uh, but people sometimes use that as argument uh, because they, they do want to maintain the view of nature as um, nasty and a struggle for life. Uh, nature is presented still by most people as the place where extreme competition happens. Um, and, and you see that also in the anthropology literature where they constantly emphasize how cooperative the human species is, so it's extremely cooperative characters and these animals they're all competing with each other and they don't even know what cooperation is they're they're very poor at it and and i think that's the strangest argument you know nature is full of cooperation mm -hmm. among all sorts of animals and i'm not even thinking about the social insects and i'm thinking of all sorts of species cooperate and to emphasize now all of a sudden because that's a sort of fashionable at the moment cooperation in humans and then contrast it with the other species i think is, uh, is hopeless. It, 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 it goes back to, because I mentioned that uh, in the old days, we only looked at aggressive behavior and violence. It goes back to that time because when it comes to violence and aggression, we, we, 
we always favor the connection with animals. If people kill each other, we say they're acting like animals. So, so, so the, the violent behavior is always connected with nature. As soon as we humans do wonderful things, which we always do, we, we, we can also be very altruistic and nice to each other, then we claim it for ourselves. And we say that that's us. We, we call it humane behavior. It's, it's us. We are the ones who are nice and, and animals cannot be that way. And, and I think it's a simplification of nature, a simplification of us uh, and of the connection between the two. But yeah, that happens quite a bit. Yeah, and for context there, Sanjit also has recently worked on some, uh, let's see, expression of grief in elephant society. So um, yeah, elephants, that question is I've, I've worked with elephants actually, and I think the elephant is, is another underestimated creature. Uh, and and uh, certainly in terms of emotions, I think the elephant has an enormous um, range of emotions to offer. Can, can I, so I, I want to get in this next audience question from Kenneth, but before I do, I'll preface it a little bit. So Franz, you were just explaining um, or, or, or talking about the parallels and, and continuities between potentially um, these experiences or behaviors in other species and ourselves. And primatologists have long been in the business of trying to understand, you know, where we come from. And there's a lot of kind of fraught uh, rhetoric around biological, for example, determinism uh, that has expressed itself in various ways. Even Conrad Lorenz has an unfortunate kind of run in with the eugenicists. And of course, there's still debates about the biology of IQ, whether it's even something scientists should consider or study. But um, Kenneth has a question here about kind of responsibility of scientists. And I think you're a good person to answer it, having written many popular books about it. So Kenneth, do you want to come and throw this one at France? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about this, especially when you were uh, mentioning the context of overemphasizing on aggression and in uh, non-human primates, whereas reconciliation also happens a lot. I was wondering if you think that primatologists have uh, some form of indirect responsibility to be aware of uh, in how we see ourselves uh, when we potentially overemphasize on some topics. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that in relation to my gender book. Because some people, some feminists, they look at biology as the enemy. Because they feel biology is deterministic, uh, reductionistic. And biology tells humans how to behave. And they don't want to hear that. Uh, and so they look at biology as something to be avoided and, and something problematic. And I think I agree with them to some degree in the sense that the way we biologists have handled the topics is not appropriate. So, so remember, for example, how Dawkins would talk about biology. Richard Dawkins would say, we are the slaves of our genes. We are here to carry out the programs of our genes. Ed Wilson had the same sort of talk in social biology. Like social biology will take over the world and we don't, we barely need the social sciences. And, and they would give lip service to culture. They would say, ah, culture is sort of, sort of important. Uh, and maybe we primatologists, since we understand the interaction between cultural learning and biology. We, we are studying this. And, and since we sometimes work with species like chimpanzees and bonobos who are, we consider adult when they're 14, 15, 16. I mean, they have a very long development. Uh, elephants is another good example. Whales are another good example. There are animals who are very slow and why are they slow in their development? It's because they need to learn an enormous amount of things before they are competent adults. And so we primatologists maybe have a responsibility to wean pe people off this idea that biology is deterministic, that biology is, is sort of the dictator who tells us how to behave. Uh, and in biology of the 1970s and 80s has, uh, and, and if you go back to Lawrence with his instincts, that's even more primitive in a way, we have been giving this message that biology is in charge. And, and I think we should be much more careful and much more modest 
in how we promote the idea of biology, because biology always interacts with the environment. There is no pure biology in the world. There is no pure culture in the world. And, and I think um, we primatologists, we, we are in an excellent position to bring that message. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. So I think in your career, if I read you well, Franz, one of the things you've, you've often noted was that uh, we also have a very high opinion of what it is that we do and how it is that we think. And I wonder if maybe you can um, comment on human exceptionalism and maybe some of the problems with that. And, 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 and also maybe you can eventually get into the idea of anthropodenial denial as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, humans, I don't know why we have that. We, we, we want to be unique and different. And, and we are, of course, in a way, unique and different. Uh, but we want to emphasize that. And the entire fields, like especially anthropology, where, where that's almost like the topic. It's like they say <clears> that <throat> the, the topic of anthropology is to find out what is special about humans. And I don't know why we have gotten into that position where we need to find out what's special about humans, because I think humans are primates and 95% and, and of what we do is primate-like. And yeah, there's a few things that are human-like, but why focus on these on that small tip of the iceberg? But they, they want to do that. And I invented the word anthropodenial because I got sick and tired of the word anthropomorphism being thrown at everything you propose. <laughs> as soon as you say animals have empathy or they cooperate or they have politics or whatever you say that is new to people, especially, because once they accept it, they accept it. But when you throw a new thing at them, they say that's anthropomorphic. And that's an immediate rejection because we cannot be anthropomorphic. That's just not acceptable. And, and so I invented the word anthropodenial for people who deny the connection with other species. And unfortunately, that, that is still a very substantial group in academia. Hmm. So, so I sometimes find the general public more open-minded than the academics. So when you talk, for example, about emotions in animals, you know, there's always people who come up to you and say, my dog or my cat. They always talk about their pets, of course. They, they don't necessarily talk about the farm animals as, as if these are a different category who, who don't have emotions, but they have emotions too. Uh, but, but at least the general public has no trouble with you saying that animals can have emotions. But academics, there's still quite a few who, who will say, what do you mean? What do you mean by emotions? And, and how do you define them? And then before you know it, you're in a sort of semantic debate and you're not going to go anywhere with that. But um, uh, there is a, a strong tendency in humans to want to be exceptional. Uh, I think um, humans are much less special than they think. Uh, even for language, you know, language is the one trait that I think is really specifically human. But if you were to measure human sound production, like, like, like my voice here and, and, and my sounds, if you were to analyze them the way we, we analyze primate vocalizations, you would not find out that it's very special. It's a sort of gibberish that's coming out. You would probably see the spectrograms and you, you would have no clue that this was a symbolized kind of language. And, and that means automatically also that we may be underestimating the sounds of other species. If you, if you measure the sounds of, let's say, a dolphin with a hydrophone, who knows what these dolphins are communicating with each other? We have no clue, probably. Uh, it may not be symbolized, that's possible, but, but it may still be very special. So I think um, people emphasize these things and, and they, they always have differences that they propose. And, and uh, if you have a long life, like uh, Mike and I, we have been around a long time. We have seen many, <laughs> we have seen many claims come and go. Um, you know, um, you can probably make a list of 20 claims that have been around about how special humans are mm -hmm. that have fallen apart somehow. So, yeah. but that's sort of the pattern, you know? Yeah, yeah. I in addition to the claims, you've also seen the methodologies change a lot from when you started to what you're doing now and how we kind of test for these things. It could be theory of mind. It could be empathy. It could be any other sort of behavior. And now I am going to call on Sanjana, actually, because uh -huh. she had a question very relevant to this right okay. now. Can you put on your camera, Sanjana, or your, your mic? 
Uh, I've put on my mic. Can you yeah, hear please. me? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, please. Um, yes. Yeah. Following up on both the progress for how research is being done and for feeling and emotion based, the idea of how you can test feelings or emotions or these debates. Nowadays, we are moving more towards eye tracking and we're trying to use technology for a lot of different ways to record data and to capture data. So how would you, what are your thoughts on these kind of a, um, ex- approaches? Like, would it be a good explanation? Is Are there good uses for justifying like emotions or feelings? Yeah, or- yeah I, I love the eye tracking study that was done on the theory of mind, for example. Um, uh, so eye tracking is, is really a very good new technique. Of course, the field workers are also using increasingly um, molecular techniques of getting at oxytocin and DNA. And that's, that's enormously increasing. I think also we're going to get uh, non-invasive neuroscience. I don't like in, invasive neuroscience on the primates. I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, and, and I think, but non-invasive neuroscience is of course done on humans all the time. You put them in scanners and, and we give them a, a, a potential problem and we see what their brain is doing. And um, we are not at the point yet that that's easy with the primates. And and, uh, I know that some people are training monkeys to be in the scanner or training dogs to be in the scanner. But um, when the technology advances, maybe we can get non-invasive neuroscience going on them. And uh, that will also help tremendously getting at these questions of consciousness and feelings versus emotions and uh, what's going on inside. We, We basically would be opening the black box, I think, uh, so, so I think that's going to come. Uh, it's not entirely there yet, but I would recommend everyone who is a primatologist, and especially those who are interested in cognition and emotions, to to get some degree in neuroscience as well. I think that that's going to be the future. And, and, and again, I, I'm not for um, the invasive type uh, that used to be common, you know, uh, lesions in the brain or electrodes in the brain. But but I think non-invasive neuroscience has a future in primatology too. Yeah. yeah. Maybe this is a funny one to follow that up with, but no- novel technologies, there's also one classic technology, which is the mirror self-recognition test, which I know you've, you've been involved with for, uh, for various uh-huh. studies. But so do cleaner RAS have theory of mind? Three year of mind, I don't know, but um, I'm very impressed by CODA's studies on the on these fish. It's just amazing. And, and, and I've developed this idea, um, well, I'm not the only one, I'm sure, uh, that, that you need to good at, look at it as a gradualist perspective. So instead of saying there are some animals who have self-awareness and other animals who don't, which is what the mirror test used to say, you know, like um, the... The great apes have it and all other species don't have it. Uh, I think there, there's a, there are gradual differences. For example, monkeys. I worked with capuchin monkeys. They don't mistake the mirror image for a stranger. They, they don't react to the mirror image as if it's a stranger. It's not themselves. They don't make that connection, but it's also not a stranger. So what is it? It's in between. And, and the child developmental people, they say that children reach a stage also like that. They, they recognize themselves at the age of 18 months to 24 months. But before that time, the half year before that time, they are also in between. They, they don't see it as themselves, but they also don't see it as a stranger. So that's, I, I think we need to have a more subtle vocabulary about the whole thing rather than saying that some animals are self-aware and others are not, because I bet every animal needs some level of self-awareness, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the go go back to the title of one of your books. I don't think we're smart enough yet to know how smart yeah. animals are. <laughs> yeah, we, we are, we're constantly struggling with this issue, but it's so interesting that we live in a time that we are allowed to do that. Because there was yeah. a time when I was young, if you would say this this chimp understands that A leads to B you would be criticized because the word understanding was, you were not allowed to use that for animals. Animals don't understand. Animals learn contingencies, but that's all they do. Yeah. Well, Franz, our hour is pretty much up here and uh, we'd like to let you go, but maybe you just maybe recommended one piece of advice for all the young primatologists and students that maybe neuroscience, non-invasive neuroscience could be one important avenue to look into. Do you have any other kind of parting words for the young scholars here and maybe how to 
go forward and forge their special careers as you've done? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the field work needs to continue and, and I hope it can continue for a long time. We all know that the primates are in trouble and, and I think um, that, that's certainly an important avenue. And, and I think the people who work on cognition and emotions, they have an enormous field in front of them because I really think we only have scratched the surface uh, at this point, uh, especially because we were held back for so long to look into this. And, and so I think for the younger generation, there's an enormous amount of things to discover and they should not be shy in proposing totally new things that everyone objects to uh, because objections is part of the, of the game, basically. You need to fight them and then um, not be too impressed by them, I think. Yeah. Well, Dr. Francois, thank you so much for taking this time and being generous and uh, sharing your stories with us. And to everyone in the audience, thanks for joining. And I hope you um, enjoyed this as much as we did. So thank we'll you. see you next time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Franz. Thanks. Bye-bye.